Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a Range Rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor all over them. back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. And in this video, we take a look at the connections involved in this case. Who was connected to Darren Nichols? Who was connected to the corrupt officers in which he passed information onto? Just how easy would it have been to have framed Jack Wombs and Michael Steele for a crime they did not commit? Now this video is purely theoretical, so please don't take it as the gospel truth. But I'm trying to look at a reason or a way in which Michael Steele and Jack Wombs could have been potentially framed for the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Just how feasible is it that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs are both wholeheartedly innocent of the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. How possible is it that they were actually framed for these murders? How do we explain the fact that cell data, mobile phone records, put them near the scene of the crime at the time these murders were supposedly committed? How do we also account for Darren Nichols' testimony stating that he was the getaway driver on the evening of December the 6th? And how do we also account for the seemingly poor alibis provided by both men on the evening of December the 6th? Now, this video has not been made as a statement towards Michael Steele and Jack Wombs' guilt or innocence, but I want to give you a little bit of background on how such an event could actually be orchestrated by the people in the background involving this story. Firstly, let's take a look at really the key player in the entire Essex Boys case. And it may surprise you that this person is actually Darren Nichols. You need to look at who Darren Nichols was actually associated with during the time these murders were committed. Now, what we do know as a fact is that Darren Nichols was a police informant. He had contact with two corrupt officers who were later discharged from the force. What exactly happened with the information that was passed on from Darren Nichols to these officers? What exactly was the relationship between Darren Nichols and these two officers? We are given the portrayal that Darren Nichols was really working for them. He was providing information in order for financial reward. We also know that Darren Nichols gave information to these officers regarding Michael Steele's importation business, what drugs were being brought in, how much was being brought in, and who he was importing with. Now, it would be a little bit naive and foolish to believe that this information simply stayed with the Bent police officers. It's my opinion that this actual information, this sensitive information, would have actually have made its way from Michael Steele to Darren Nichols to the corrupt officers, and then it would have been passed on to other criminals in the criminal network. I think that when we look at this case, we have a tendency to really focus on the individuals actually directly concerned with the murder, the deceased Tucker, Tate and Rolf, Nichols, Wombs and Steele. But I think to get the answers and really just how likely it was that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs were framed for a crime they didn't commit, you really need to look a little bit outside of the box. Who was Darren Nichols connected with? Did he have more corrupt officers that he was in discussion with? And did these corrupt officers that we know about have far-reaching tentacles in the criminal network? Now, just how likely would it be that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs were completely framed for the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Let's say, for instance, Michael Steele is 
talking openly with the two people he trusts, Jack Wombs and Darren Nichols. But little does Michael Steele know. But the actual information he's talking about or giving to the people involved in these importations is actually being passed on to these corrupt officers. But then what the worst part of this is, and what Michael Steele won't be aware of, is that this information is then being fed to other criminals in the network. Now, what that does, it puts Michael Steele in a rather vulnerable position here. We even have transcripts of calls between Darren Nichols and one of these corrupt officers, which talks about stealing a carload of Michael Steele's drugs, which would have been worth around £150,000 at the time. Now, I have no idea how in-depth these plans actually went and how willing they were to actually do this, but at least we know that this was discussed and they were seemingly open to the idea of committing such an offence. One of the main problems we have when researching this case is that we don't really know who some of the main players were associated or linked to. We have no real idea if Darren Nichols was an informant with other officers. We have no real idea who was linked to the corrupt officers themselves. Did they have links to the criminal underworld? Did they simply have links to the criminal network? Was this information which was being passed on by Darren Nichols actually being sold on to other criminals? Now, the way it's portrayed by Darren Nichols is that he was giving this information and the officer was using it and really trying to pass it on to his superiors in order to gain promotion and work his way up the policing ladder. But what if that was simply false? What happens if Darren Nichols provides information on Michael Steele's importation business and this information gets back to drug rivals, to other gangs, to other members of the criminal fraternity. When you actually read between the lines regarding these two officers who were discharged from the Essex Police Force, you don't really get the sense that these people were doing it in order to gain some sort of promotion or favour from their superiors. To me, it comes across as all about money. If someone would pay them a certain amount for some information, they were happy to provide that information. But if this information got into the wrong hands, is it feasible that they could have placed Michael Steele and Jack Wombs near the scene of the crime when they planned to commit the murder of Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Now, the relationship between Darren Nichols and these officers, it gives the impression that the officer is in control, that Darren Nichols is giving information in return for a financial reward. But oftentimes in the police informant handler relationship, these dynamics can be turned on their head. It only takes the handler to persuade the officer to cross a line or to do things which are not by the book. Then all of a sudden, this police informant has complete control over the serving officer. Is this a scenario which could have taken place regarding Darren Nichols. He portrays a scene where he has got in too deep. He's gone too far. He doesn't know how to turn back. He's giving these people information. They want more and more and more. But why was Darren Nichols so concerned when this officer was arrested? Surely he wasn't naive enough to believe that he was going to be saved from this situation by one of these corrupt officers. Was Darren Nichols actually concerned because he was worried that this officer was going to blow the lid on exactly what Darren Nichols had been doing? Did Darren Nichols in fact turn the tables on these corrupt officers and get them to cross lines that they weren't actually comfortable with? And Darren Nichols in turn really became the shot caller. Now if this sounds a little bit far-fetched, I completely agree with you, but if you do some research on the topic of police handlers and police informants, this is one of the main ways in which police officers actually become corrupted in the first place. They are encouraged and invited to take risks, to do things which aren't by the book in order to gain financial reward. Once they have crossed that line, it is incredibly difficult to go back. What then happens is that the informant becomes in control of those serving officers. We know that Darren Nichols has a great ability to portray a sense of naivety almost, and a sense of really not understanding the full effects of what he's doing. 
but he also managed to escape jail for a triple murder that he had some sort of involvement in. So this clearly isn't someone who is stupid. What exactly was Darren Nichols' relationship with these officers? Is it as it was portrayed all along in his book and in the documentaries and in really the documents that we read, that these officers were controlling him? Or did he have a lot of information on these officers which he was using to his own advantage? So what exactly are the risks associated with giving information to these corrupt officers? Not the risk for Darren Nichols as such, but what is the risk for Michael Steele? How is it possible that he could be really framed for such a serious crime? Let's just say, for instance, you're involved in the drugs business. Let's just say that maybe you're a drug rival or you're someone who's actually invested in one of these consignments which is about to go south. You realise that you've invested a lot of money, it's been heard through the grapevine by this officer, that someone actually intends on keeping their share of the money and you're not going to see a penny back. You then decide that Tucker Tate and Rolf need to be taken out of the game completely. You are then in a position of power to some degree where you have knowledge of information which Michael Steele believes is private between himself, Jack Wombs, Darren Nichols, Tucker, Tate and Rolf. But little does Michael Steele know, but the outside investors or possibly even drug rivals are absolutely privy to all of his drugs dealings, where he's bringing it in from, how his deals are going, who he's associated with. Is it too far-fetched to suggest that Darren Nichols may have passed on some information to one of these corrupt officers and this information has then been filtered through a network to other people who wanted to see harm come to Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Now we are told by Darren Nichols that he simply gave these officers information. But is it too far-fetched to believe that Darren Nichols may have also have taken on a fair amount of information from these officers in return? When you look at it like that, you're left with Darren Nichols really being at the centrepiece of this entire situation. You have him being given information indirectly by Michael Steele and also possibly taking on information from other criminal gangs and organisations which is being passed on by these police officers. How difficult would it be to arrange a meeting or to arrange a situation or concoct a situation in which Michael Steele and Jack Wombs are placed near the scene of the crime and they're simply put in a situation they can't possibly get out of. The problem we have with this case is one which I've discussed on a few occasions, is that we have a lot of information still missing. We have no idea if Darren Nichols had other contacts, other corrupt police officers on his books. We have no idea who these corrupt officers were actually in touch with. But what we have here is an incredibly dangerous situation with an insider who is freely giving information from Michael Steele to an officer. But where is this information going? If this information gets into the wrong hands, how difficult would it be to place them somewhere and get them fitted up for murder? It would be quite easy. Now, personally, I find it hard to believe that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs had absolutely no knowledge of these murders and no knowledge that they were going to take place because their alibis were relatively poor. They were unsubstantiated and really that was their weakest link in the entire case. They didn't have uh, an airtight alibi. They, they, you know, the, the alibis that they had were simply not sufficient in order to see their freedom. But what we have is Darren Nichols being at the centrepiece of this entire situation. Is this overthinking it? Is, is it, is it? is this going a bit too far in assuming that this is how it all may have gone down? Well, the research I've done into police corruption and the way the police handler and police informant relationship works makes me question exactly how truthful Darren Nichols is being regarding his relationship with that supposed corrupt officer. Who was really in charge of that relationship? Was it simply Darren Nichols getting paid for information on relatively low-level offences? Or was it a little bit more sinister? Did Darren Nichols push this officer to actually take some risks? And when he actually got arrested, he was really genuinely concerned that this officer was going to blow the lid on exactly what Darren Nichols had been up to. If Jack Wombs and Michael Steele are wholeheartedly innocent of the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf, 
then this is certainly a way I could see it being orchestrated. You need to look at a person or a collective group of people who wanted to see the back of not only Jack Wombs and Michael Steele, but most importantly, Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Who would have gained from all of these individuals being taken off the streets? Would it be someone who was in the importation game? Would it be a big time drug smuggler or drug dealer? Someone who wanted not only Tucker, Tate and Rolf dead, but Steele and Wome set up for their murder. I think we can all agree that we simply don't have all of the information. We don't really know just how deep this runs. How many connections did these officers have? What information was being fed back to Darren Nichols? Exactly what information was Nichols giving to these corrupt officers? And where exactly did all of this information go? If you would like to learn more about the Range Rover murders, then click on the video in front of you now. You will also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.